Happy New Year! We are thrilled to be back and excited for an incredible 2020. If you're interested in learning more about setting up a photorealistic ArcViz scene, we've got you covered. The new ArcViz interior rendering sample project and accompanying documentation will guide you through a quaint apartment scene and demonstrate best practices, asset and material workflows, optimizations, and other techniques for use in your own projects. Many thanks to Pasquale Cianti of Cianti Design for leading the design work on this sample. Head over to the Learn tab of the Epic Games Launcher and try it out today. As of last month, Epic Games has awarded more than $13 million of financial support to more than 200 recipients as part of the Epic Mega Grants program. This series of disbursements marks a record for Epic's grant commitments, officially surpassing the four-year distributed total of the initiative's predecessor, the Unreal Dev Grants, in only eight months. Please visit our blog to see a short selection of participating projects, followed by a list of publicly announced recipients. It's a new year and new free assets are now available on the marketplace. Whether you want to build up gritty environments with abandoned factory buildings and dark forest assets, or speed up your development with an action RPG inventory system, an interaction system, and smooth sync tools, there's something for you in this month's offering. Plus, drive away with a vehicle variety pack, now part of our permanent collection. To take Deliver Us the Moon's visuals out of this world, Unreal Dev Grant recipient Kyokin Interactive leveraged NVIDIA and Unreal's ray tracing technology, where they found implementation easy and straightforward, even in the late stages of development. Find out how the small indie studio determined where and how to make the most of ray tracing in their guest tech blog. Our teams here at Epic continuously work to improve and battle test our features, making sure they're ready for prime time. Niagara, our particle tool in early access, is no exception. Lead FX artist Scott Kennedy discusses what we've learned from integrating Niagara into Fortnite's existing pipeline, what successes and challenges the team faced, and what you can expect to see from the tool in the future. You can check it out all on our blog. Looking to expand your Unreal Engine skill set? Check out the latest courses to arrive on the Unreal Engine online learning catalog, including AEC Blueprints by example and your first hour in Sequencer. Once you've completed a course, share your well-earned badges and encourage others to continue on their Unreal journey. And now for the first round of Weekly Karma Earners of the Year. Shadow River, Blind Minds, Tisumi Saki, Joseph, Clockwork Ocean, Eric321123, Chur, Harry Highdef, Rhoda Mess, and Vision. Thanks for pitching in and helping out folks on Answer Hub. First up this week is a vibrant narrative exploration game called Mythic Ocean. Befriend a pantheon of oceanic gods and shape the fate of the cosmos. Celebrate their release date and download it today. Here's a beautiful fur sample created for this snow leopard. See a breakdown of the creature on Marcos's ArtStation page where he shares his pipeline and step-by-step -step shots. Last up this week is Blink Rogues, a fast-paced top-down shooter. It plays like a shmup and feels like a deathmatch. Duke it out in short and intense matches, flip your ship, teleport to the enemy lane, steal their loot, or simply frag for points. Thanks for tuning in for the News and Community Spotlight. Hi everyone and welcome to Inside Unreal, a weekly show where we learn, explore and celebrate everything Unreal together. I'm your host, Victor Broden, and my guest today is senior technical writer, Tim Hobson. Yes, sir. Welcome back, back to the studio. <laughs> Here again. Yep. All right. We just came back from our break. Mm -hmm. It's been a good week. This is for me. I don't know about you. Maybe I should ask you. <laughs> How's your week been, Tim? Oh, it's been good so far. Okay, nice. I'm here, right? Yes, you are. Yes, there you are. We're here. <laughs> we're live. We're making cool stuff. Um, and today, we are going to show you a little bit of some of the new features and improvements that have been done to the editor in 424. Yep. Tim's been nice to prepare a little bit of a uh, content for us. Yeah, so um, 
Today we're going to kind of take a look at some of the variant manager updates. Um, and talking with Victor, it's like we hadn't really shown a lot with that before, so I'm going to do a little bit of a refresher on that as mm -hmm. well. And you know, for anyone who's kind of not familiar with it, you can kind of get a quick idea. And I have a project that I used during Unreal Academy this past summer, so uh, um, show off hopefully some cool stuff. And it, it actually kind of ties back into some of the newer features coming in with it, uh, because I was using an old workflow, and we have mm -hmm. some new ones to kind of replace that, and then. We'll also show a little bit of uh, screen space uh, global illumination, and then the simplified sun and sky actor that we had, along with uh, a little tease at the end for some other stuff. Little tease. So, little tease. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, so yeah, let's just go ahead and jump right in, um, and we'll take a look at uh, the variant manager stuff. Okay, so just um, to, to give you an idea real quick about the variant manager, um, it's used for uh, different types of visualizations and demonstrations of uh, different types of products. So um, let me just kind of play here, and I'll show what I did with Unreal Academy. Uh, you can still see my TV has the logo. <laughs> I wasn't going to change that out this week. Um, but what I was able to do uh, with the Variant Manager is we can control a bunch of different assets without having to use a lot of Blueprint logic to trade it out inside of the editor. Um, I can just use an asset that kind of controls a lot of that for me. So it enables me to quickly make this UI panel and what I can do is I can do different layouts. So I've got this old furniture, and then oh, switch that. <laughs> I, yeah, I should have run that a little earlier. So. <laughs> yeah, I was using a uh, distance fields at the time because yeah. there's indirect lighting, and I've got a little bit of baked lighting in the scene. Um, but most everything is movable, so uh, um, that way it's all dynamic. But um, I can do these things with a variant manager where I can, you know, the same location and the same, you know, assets. I'm just taking that that reference of that actor in the scene, mm -hmm. and I'm just changing out the asset that's actually used. So all these couches or chairs or, or other objects, um, you can start to do these things like where I can switch out things, and it's all controlled through the variant manager. Um, and the UI hookups here in UMG are, are relatively simple. So um, I, my Unreal Academy talk uh, that I did and demonstration is all on our Unreal Academy, or not Unreal Academy, the uh, Unreal Learning site. Um, we'll go find a link for that. Yeah, so uh, you can kind of get a little bit more of a quick overview of, of what I did in that scene and some of these setups. Um, but this just is more of a quick, just kind of to show you what it can do. And then let's look at some of the assets. So um, let me move my guy here because I've got my little character pawn. So if I open up my... Uh, Actually, you know what? Before I even jump into that of how we do all that, let me show you how you enable this thing so that we can kind of get started. Um, so if we go up to Edit, Plugins, um, it's part of our uh, Datasmith, uh, or more of our enterprise visualization stuff. But if we look up here and type in Variant Manager, um, you'll find two plugins in here. One's for Variant Manager content. So you can have all this content, like if you're handed a project that has this enabled, you can see all this content, you won't be able to edit it. But if you uh, enable the Variant Manager plugin, um, it'll give you access to all these things like where you can actually uh, edit them. So and once that's enabled in your project, um, we can go over here to our content browser. You can click Add New or right click, and then we're going to search for miscellaneous. And then we have a le level variant sets. And what this gives me is a variant manager here. And what we can do is we can create a variant set and then we can add different variations of whatever that set is. Okay. So that's just the, the basics of that. Um, but let's look at one that I've already set up here for the, the living room. It's been cooking all night, hasn't it? Yes. <laughs> um, so with this one, what I did is I set up the furniture. I, and you can see that it's showing me all the actors that are contained within that. Um, and then when I click each variant set is just showing me um, that each of these are identical as far as the names of what the assets are. But each one of these actors, I can enable different properties and choose what properties I'm changing on each one. So um, let me scale some of this stuff down. Working on single monitor versus double gets hard sometimes. Everyone gets to do it on the stream. <laughs> <laughs> right. Uh, so uh, as I'm changing through these assets, you um, click around the room, you can see where they are, and I've got some relative locations, you know, or, or whatever your properties are that are in your details for that asset, you're able to uh, adjust these uh, relatively quickly. Um, 
So the one cool thing about the variant manager as well is that while working in the editor, you can use this, or you can use this while working in the editor, or mm -hmm. you can use it with those UI hookups that I showed at the beginning, where you can actually use it in game. Okay. So it, it doesn't have to always be like, oh, I've, I've got to use this in game. You can actually just use it for quick iteration in your levels as well. So, um, so the variant sets that I have here is this uh, this living room with the old rendering apartment scene and then when I quickly change out uh, or double click onto another one um, it's switching out to whatever those assets are that I have assigned here in the properties so but as you can see um, what I have here and I'll show some of this in later because like there's been a workflow change for how we do some of the um, in, in this release okay and this is using the old workflow but I'll show the new workflow in a minute um, but the Let's uh, go back to my blank one here, and let's add a, an actor, and then uh, I want to show off one of these newer things. So, uh, with the, whatever variation I'm creating first, let's just say that I'm going to take this chair um, and I drag this from my world, because uh, whatever actors live in the world is whatever you're going to be able to change here. All right. Um, so it's not from the content browser or anything specific like that. So. Whenever you drag it on uh, to your variant here, you're given this property matrix of, of like all these these options that you can do and you can search. And these are all just things that are, are located typically in your, your details panel. So if I want to change the material, I can just search for material. And I can see whatever material slots I have there and then what I want it to change for that. Um, and actually, you can see multiple ones here because I select the level set blueprint, which has all these objects. Uh, sorry, multiple windows. But you can see them all highlighted kind of yeah. up here. Um, sorry about that. Um, I'll tell you what, you know what? Let me do this again and not focus on that. Let me just find a chair. I think I'd be more organized, wouldn't you? Well, some days <laughs> are better than others. All right, so let's just drag this guy in here this armchair and create that and then what we can say is I've got my material here so if I just select that we can see that now I have just that actor and I select and then I can choose whatever material I want to be on that chair so if I were to change it I've now got whatever other material that random material that I just selected mm -hmm. in the plot um, and then But one of the cooler things is uh, this is a new feature in 424. We have this record button here um, where we can actually record whatever properties I'm changing. And they automatically get carried over to the variant manager. So if I come over here and I say that I want my rotation to change, um, it goes ahead and it adds that, that relative rotation property straight into the variant values here. And it applies that. And it updates it. Um, same for changing any of the properties here, like if I change it to movable, I go ahead and I get that property. I don't have to worry about coming back and manually adding any of these property sets. So I can make iteration and level design, you know, or, or level iteration for these different variations much more simple for you when you're setting up your initial variant. And just to clarify, this is in 424 and the, the old assets work even with the new version of the oh, variant absolutely. manager, but we have updated the, the workflow, right? The workflow has been updated, right, yeah. So we have this as a new workflow. Um, we also have, uh, what I'll get into next, um, is uh, we now have what's called a switch actor um, that can be accessed through the modes panel, and I'll, I'll show that demonstration. Because okay. my old workflow is like, I created everything using a blueprint, and I had all my assets in there, because then I only had that one single asset that I was managing, uh -huh. instead of all these different ones that I had to, to, to add. Um, granted, it still saw all of those, but it made it much easier to add those assets in my hierarchy mm -hmm. um, here under my actors and, uh, and reference them rather than uh, trying to make sure that I clicked everything in the, in the world that I wanted. Um, but uh, really quickly, too, let's drag this down here. Um, and let me go back to one of my other variants here. Let's come to furniture one. And what I had is, uh, so you'll notice that you don't really get a sense of what these different variants are either. 
um, everything is just like a blank uh -huh. gray image that's kind of you know dull and it's just like ah you know I don't know what this is. Um, so this feature I think has actually been in since uh, the last release, but it's I think it's worth calling out and kind of cool. Um, so if I come to lamps here, what I can do is I've got lamp one. So all I'm doing is just double clicking on that; it swaps it out. Can line it up, and when I right click, I can do a create thumbnail. Oh, and it cool! Gives, and it gives me that one, so I can quickly see that that's that lamp. And then if I do the same for swapping it out, create thumbnail, and now I get that that other lamp uh, that I can see. And, you know, it may be worthwhile to to do more of a zoomed in look if you want to see specifically if it's yeah. just that asset, but you have multiple in the room. Um, and knowing which one is uh, which, so yeah. So that's 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 a, that's a really nifty kind of feature yeah. that I didn't actually have access to when I was doing the Unreal Academy thing. So a lot of this was, you know, it, it, I'm a very visual person. So mm -hmm. you know, going through this list, and it's just kind of like, okay, click on this. What's in this? And it's like, you know, um, and as you can see, some of my names were just kind of like very basic, like set yeah. one, set two, you know. Um, but. Okay, so the other, uh, the last thing that I want to show on this new feature is for the. So if we come up here to the modes panel and we type in switch actor, um, we can start to do uh, what I did previously, which was let's just look at the. Let me get furniture set one back here. So I have this brown bookcase. I'm actually going to go to game view so I can see a little bit better. So I have this asset right here, and as you can see, uh, it's called Bookshelf BP, and it's a blueprint um, that just contains all of my assets. So it contains whatever that variation was that I created that I wanted to have here. Um, you know, and uh, this is all in a blueprint that's managed, and then I can open that in Variant Manager. Um, that doesn't necessarily make level editing the easiest because you always have to open up a blueprint. You mm -hmm. have to go back into side something else uh, to start editing it and start working with it again. Um, Everything is also relative to the rubric of that blueprint. Right, exactly. So um, it can make things a little bit more difficult to work with. But it's like if we're working with the editor hierarchy over here in the world outliner, um, what I can then do is I can drag in the switch actor. Um, let me go back to game view so I can see things. Um, so I have the switch actor, and then you don't have to do this, but this is probably just an easier thing to manage, is I can do these create empty actors, and then I'll just place it near there. Um, and I'm going to drag it onto my switch actor here. So then I'm starting to create this parent hierarchy of, of these things. I'm going to call this, I'll just say var1. Then let me come over here and find a bookshelf or something. Maybe. And now if you have a lot of assets, you can filter them. Yeah. I don't remember. <laughs> All right, so like this shelving unit right here that I, you know, I'm dragging in. Um, so SM gear or whatever, and then if I come down and I put it under variant one, I'm going to make that movable. There we go. So now I have this variation one of whatever this uh, this actor is. And then if I just duplicate it, I can create this like whole parent-child hierarchy so I can put objects on the shelf. Um, I think I got some bases here. So. Oh yeah, everything has to be movable too. Um, so I put this under here, and I've got this variation that's got you know this base sitting on a shelf, kind of thing. Close this for a second, and then if I duplicate, you don't have to duplicate. You can create another one. I'm just duplicating for ease, and then duplicate these as well. Um, so now I've got these two variations here, and it's going by whatever the, the next child is under the switch actor. And when I select my base switch actor up here, 
um, we'll see that we have a selected option. And I can now choose between whatever these are. Okay. So this is doing the same thing that the variant manager was doing for me in these assets. Mm -hmm. um, and I can now do it right within the level. So, uh, you know, if you're creating, like, I think we have a demo of showing, like, a, um, it was in the release notes at anyway, at least, of, uh, like, a motorcycle and changing out the trim or changing out some uh, some colored parts on it or whatever. Um, and all it is is just using the switch actor, and then we can swap out these these pieces and do a, a quick in-editor yeah. switch um, while level editing. Um, so it would be a quick way without having to worry about, like, all the blueprint setup or having to worry about... Um, you know, managing assets inside of the variant manager and controlling these things. Um, they can give you some quick level editing options. Would you say that using the var variant manager UI that you have there um, would be used for more complex variants? And then maybe you can rely on the, uh, the switch actor when you have sort of simpler sets that you want to switch between? Uh, yeah, I think so. Um, yeah, because, you know, with these kind of assets too, like when I export them, you know, it's going to grab whatever's referenced by them. Mm -hmm. um, so I can actually, you know, send that to someone, and it has all the photo hierarchy. Okay. It, it'll, it'll save everything. They can drag and drop it in their level. Um, same if, uh, you know, and with these as well, if I want to use any kind of blueprint um, interaction, you can do this with the switch actor as well. Um, you can if, reference. If, if it's in the level, it can be referenced. Um, so with the variant manager, let me open up the furniture one. Um, with this one where I have my, my different furniture and everything, uh, I actually have this variant itself from the level um, dragged into my level and being referenced. So it's grabbing everything and that way it, it enables UMG to be able to hook up and me to be able to have my interactions here with swapping things in and out um, and doing it. It's not going to reference the content browser. It's referencing okay. that level variant asset in the level. And so. also makes it a little bit easier to iterate or yeah, collaboratively so uh, work on an asset rather than something inside the scene, right? Because then right. you actually have to check out the, the level. Yes. So. So yeah, there's uh, there's a couple of different options, and and uh, we're pretty well documented on uh, the variant manager with these different workflows. Mm -hmm. um, it's just some new things that we've kind of iterated on and improved. So, uh, gives you gives you a little extra added uh, ways to to add variants uh, variations to your. You're seeing, especially uh, for those working in enterprise manufacturing and visualization, mm -hmm. you know, fields, um, where maybe you don't need to be, uh, you don't need to know all this blueprint magic, you know, uh, and scripting to to be able to hook this up. Um, and I went through this in the uh, in my Unreal Academy video, but BP, I think that's what we call it, BP main. Um, so my UI is just a bunch of simple um, objects here with buttons, and then in my graph, um, let's see here. you know, it's it's nothing very complex. But these are all the the variants that I have in that level, and that's where I'm referencing them. And then that way, I can pull the information that I need, so I can set visibility on whatever this other one is or or what it's not, um, and I can switch them out by the names that I have. So that way, it's like as I do the little button toggles yeah. or whatever, it's it's saying make this one visible, make this one hidden. Um, so that's that's definitely an option as well. And, and to be clear, because they were asking, mm -hmm. this this can be done at runtime as well. I mean, that's what you're doing. Yeah, and that's that's what this is mm -hmm. right here with uh, within UMG. Um, yeah, this is this is all just my runtime stuff right yeah. here. So um, yeah, I thought that was a very like. Uh, Fun thing to it was kind of a fun project to kind of work on because like you know I got to learn a little bit about this I got to you know uh, take an existing example project that we had at the time you know this was the, the old Couch Knights apartment because it was a right. wider apartment and not as narrow um, and then just take these assets and and you know we had some free assets on the marketplace mm -hmm. at the time so I was just like okay I can start doing these variations and kind of try some stuff out so um, I don't I don't know how many. Knows about the Couch Nice demo today. It was it was uh, known when because it came with the DK2, the yeah. Oculus. Yeah, you run around with the little yeah, little couch boots. Off screen. Um, and then while I've got this part of the project open, uh, the next thing kind of wanted to dive into. Unless there's any questions about this, uh, um, I need to follow up on. Let's see. We can. I, I mean, otherwise we can hold until the end. Um, <laughs> can variants be triggered dynamically through gameplay? Yes, they can. Um, oh, here's a good question. Do the assets referenced by variants stream in and out, or are all variants 
say, for a mesh or material loaded at start? Actually, I don't know on that one. OK. Yeah, sorry. I don't know. <laughs> I'll I'm fairly certain they're, um, because of the reference, they're loaded. But I'm not going to say that that's the case. <laughs> right. Yeah. So we don't know. Uh, we can try to follow up on that one. That's actually a good question. Yeah, it is. It's good to know as well, because if you have a really big set mm -hmm. um, that contains a lot of stuff, yeah. in the startup time, right. could, yeah, yeah. It's like I, I think my largest one is the uh, um, maybe the couch. I mean, and it's got you know like maybe half a dozen or, or a dozen objects or whatever. Maybe the shelf over here has got you know, maybe a little bit more. Still not very significant. Yeah. Maybe if you compare like yeah, the shelf station of an one. engine with you know hundreds of right. bolts or yeah, and that's that's the whole thing that was you know that makes this much easier is you know with these CAD models that get imported, especially using DataSmith. Um, you know, you have all those little objects and everything mm -hmm. that we need to. To, to manage and be able to easily change out and then um, everything so cool yeah I think I think those were okay. the questions related to the Baron manager All right so um, the next one I'm going to jump into and I actually ended up adding this one on here is just a quick hookup for screen space global illumination I I, I wanted to call that one out um, I mean it's a very simple feature it's not yeah. not anything super complex um, but there's there's some kind of caveats to using it is you know it's um, you know everything in this scene is dynamic and movable, uh, with exception of my room itself, uh, just the base room with no objects, and um, the sunlight coming through is all I use. So that way, I got a you know I did some baked lighting and for that part. So that way, because I, I actually just turn all my lights off here, you can see. And then oh, that was SCGI on, so that's off. So what this was is just. Indirect lighting coming in from the from the sun there, and then just uh, lighting up this room a little bit, and then me just bumping the uh, the global illumination value up in the post process. So that way I get a little bit more bounce light um, because I knew I was using everything dynamically. Like like you'll see that you don't see very uh, like any shadows here um, under the chairs or any ambient occlusion really because um, I disabled like screen space ambient occlusion at the time. Um, so. We now have uh, you know screen space global animation, so it's like starting to play around with in this. And it's like one of the caveats is like you really since it's a screen space effect, you're limited to the normal you know artifacts that you get with screen space uh, mm -hmm. effects, which is you know it's like if it's not on the screen, it's it's not going to be visible. So it's like if I start to look down or look away, you know that's going to cause a transition. So we do recommend using it with some form of baked lighting as a fallback. Um, because, like for instance, if you have a large occluder, you know, something blocking your view near the camera, it, like if I'm coming around a corner in a very dark hallway that's indirectly lit mm -hmm. by whatever direct light, you know, screen space global illumination is going to look pretty good, you know, for part of it, but it's not going to know what's off screen. So the second I go around that corner, you know, or if I look down at an angle, you start to lose that information. So it, uh, it, it can be a very jarring kind of transition. So it's like having a fallback with with some form of bake lighting actually works better in this kind of sense. And and for this scene in particular, me just having a little bit of indirect lighting coming through and and boosting up the room, it it actually worked pretty well with all this. And then it actually added to the movable objects I have here. So that way I start to get some ambient uh, shadows around things and, and uh, we can just see here whenever I turn everything back on. And two, one of the things as well is like since I baked lighting, um, I don't get indirect. Like when I baked this, I didn't bake the lighting too with this brown floor because that would give me brown, you know, kind of like a brown reflectance, um, a bounce light on the ceiling or these other like you know lighter toned surfaces. Uh -huh. So I baked it with a, a, a soft gray. Okay, and then so, you switched it out. And then I and then I you know with my flooring here when I change out the colors, that way it doesn't directly you know see. kind yeah. of like create like a jarring effect with different colors. But if I enable um, SSGI here, we start to see, and I'll just toggle this back and forth a couple of times, we start to get some of these, uh, a nice smoother transition around these edges. It doesn't look as CG. Uh -huh. um, and it, it doesn't, you start to get some of this ambient uh, occlusion kind of effect in, in the corners and something that's a little bit more natural looking. So. And then you'll notice here under the, the chairs and everything, everything starts to look more kind of grounded in the scene rather than just this kind of floating geometry. And depending on the, 
like if I were to have a really bright colored floor, let's just say like a bright green or something, you know, it's like I'm gonna get that indirect bounce as well. So, and because SG, SSGI is a dynamic GI solution, um, the screen space based, um, it would reflect that. Okay. So, so it's it, it's a nice additive for, for some of your fallback if you're using bake lighting. So it's really nice with a little addition that we had in 424. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I mean, for for some, they, they know it's been around for, for quite a while, you know, it's like, it's I think 422, it kind of first went in, there's like a CVAR someone had to enable. So, um, one of the things... Um, you want to so, show the console command you're using to yeah, so, enable disable that? Yeah, I was actually going to show that next, because I just thought about it. <laughs> um, Great minds, minds think alike, yeah, no, someone right. said. So, um, if you, if you want to use it for your entire project, um, so it's, it's one of those things where it can be enabled, disabled at runtime. Um, and we have different quality settings for it as well. So, um, But if you know that you just you want to use it for your entire project, um, you can just come up here and search for screen space. If I can type. There we go. Um, and it would be under your engine rendering lighting section. So over here, and then all the way under rendering, and then we'll have lighting. But the search always works easier too. So, um, if you remember how what it's called and how it's spelled. Yeah, 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 exactly. Um, but yeah, you'll just have a toggle box here that um, that you can come and toggle it on, and then it just automatically be enabled. But uh, but yeah, so for enabling and disabling it, if we bring up the console here, r dot um, ssgi, and then we have a couple of commands here: um, enable, and then just one is is your enable, and then zero is your disable. Um, one of the other thing, and I'm not going to show this on the stream just because it's the quality is going to be lost on the on the compression for mm -hmm. the, the stream and it being live and all this. Um, but the docs, I did a bunch of comparisons of uh, of the quality. So with the quality settings, we have four different uh, variations, and they're all doing different uh, um, ray counts and and sample counts. So uh, I have those all listed there in the docs as well. So. Um, you can see those quality differences, and and that that also enables you to be able to use it in your scalability settings. So for your games, like if you're targeting lower end hardware or higher end hardware, you can choose what quality level you want it to be at. I think by default it's at three. So, um, so yeah, it's. Uh, I pasted the docs in the oh, okay, in the cool. chat. Um, yeah. So if there's no questions on that one, I mean, again, that was that was a pretty simple uh, one that can. Add a little bit of uh, extra life to your scenes, um, especially in, in this particular example. I wish I had had it back when I was doing the. Because uh, so as a quick aside, like you may have seen at the beginning, it said building mesh distance fields. Mm -hmm. um, so what I was doing is uh, let me actually come back up here and come back and disable this real quick. Um, so in my so we had a feature for a long time still do have that feature um, but the let me just grab keep hitting the wrong key here select all these and then if we search for um, distance filled indirect shadows um, this is what I did during the Unreal Academy one um, I used actually distance filled meshes to give me that grounded effect for all my movable objects Okay. Um, because that was a nice way to uh, to get this nice grounded shadow effect under my objects here. So if I disable that, you can see the difference that it makes yeah. there. Um, and th the beauty of this particular feature is that it doesn't require you to have uh, distance fields enabled for the entire project. You can do it per mesh. So um, that's actually it's. Uh, it's a nice little feature. I've got documentation on how to on that one as well. It's been around for quite some time. Um, but you know, if we go to visualize uh, distance fields, yeah, you can see that only the objects that I want to actually have those indirect shadows are the, the ones that were being used. So that was a little workaround I had for, for that at the time. Um, but yeah. That's pretty cool. Um, there were a few more questions about okay. um, variants. One of the questions were, uh, do variants make lighting scenarios obsolete in some way? No, I think those are completely different techniques. Right, because yeah. the lighting scenario is n normally you use it for like baked lighting, so yeah. you can have a, a scene that is yep. night and day, um, and just do a quick so, level load. So the intention there was we could uh, separate the light build data 
from the level itself, mm -hmm. and people could work directly on these different lighting scenarios for a specific level. So for instance, like if I um, uh, had my level and I wanted to do a day-night scenario for, let's just say, this apartment here, um, I could have an artist work on doing the day scenario and work on just that lighting data and check that information out versus someone working on the night data, and they're not checking out the entirety of the level. They're only checking out that scenario. So it made it much easier um, to work in that sense, and you could set up uh, those things so that way you could have one over the other loaded whenever you have that level loaded. Um, for the variant manager, um, I think most everything has to be movable. Um, I think I can have some static things. I think most most everything I used it for was uh, movable anyway, just because, uh, um, don't, don't quote me on that one. <laughs> um, but uh, I know you can change the, the property or whatever in the, the thing, so you should be able to make it. But um, for, the, for the level variant stuff itself, but for the world outliner, everything had to be movable there okay. when I was starting to work with it. So um, I'd have to go back and check real quick. But, uh, but yeah, I, I think they're different workflows, different scenarios to, to have. So Let's I see. wouldn't try and confuse the two. <laughs> yeah, most of the other questions were regarding using the variant manager at runtime. Okay. Um, yeah, I think we're good. Okay. Um, this next one, I already got a mesh open here, and this is actually from one of our sample or not sample projects, uh, one of our templates. Uh, it's in the collab viewer. We have like we, I think we show this like gear mechanism thing in our release notes quite often. Um, Mitchell has enjoyed using it, and uh, um, and I'm going to enjoy using it right here, showing off some of the UV editing yeah. uh, things that we added. So um, we we have some simple UV stuff uh, that we've added so far. Um, so if we come up here to Windows, I'm just going to show you how to enable this uh, stuff so you can get to these settings first. So if we come to plugins and then search for polygon editing. Um, you'll find this plugin, enable it, and you'll restart the editor. And what it gives you is in our editor here, we now have um, these two options are available. Um, so we can generate our UVs or we can unwrap our UVs. So with this one, um, like you'll notice here that there's this is whatever model was brought in. The UV isn't within the zero to one space, mm -hmm. um, but what we can, but you can see that we we still have some sort of UV, and we're, we've got some kind of artifact as well that's happening. Where if you can see it, like this little triangle. And actually, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna switch out to another material that makes it a little bit easier to see some of this stuff. I was playing around with this yesterday, so what is it? The master wood material. And this will make it just a little bit easier to see, since we can actually see the grains and the way the, the wood is traveling and, and, and how this uh, mesh is laid out as well. So, so if I come up here, um, I'll go over the unwrap UVs one first. Uh, so what this gives us is a way to unwrap our objects um, in a simple way. So we can choose um, how we want to unwrap it by choosing a channel. So uh, you can specify a channel, which gives you this UV channel option where I can specify exactly what channel I want. Um, and this particular mesh already had two channels, one's for a light map um, that's already been generated, and then one is for the original like base texture. Um, is zero always the texture? Yeah. Do you for yeah, and then uh, yeah, you can have multiple uh, um, UV channels. Uh, like, like if you look at speed tree assets, um, like UV one is, is typically going to be it, uh, or UV zero. Sorry, UV one is the light map. Gotta gotta remember that zero based. Um, but the automatic light map uh, setup, for instance, like if we do the unwrap there, it grays that out because um, by default we typically go by uh, UV channel one, and then the specify channel, and then the first empty channel. So um, if we were to come to uh, um, a channel that has nothing in it, I imagine it, I think it's this one here, so, um, or 
sorry, it actually generates a channel two. So this is what we get on our our unwrap. And what it's doing with the unwrap UV is we have this angle threshold, and what this looks at is each triangle and the adjacent angle of the next triangle over. Okay. And depending on if it meets that angle or not, it will break that face apart. So if I did a very stricter lower resolution, we're going to break more faces apart because that, that angle threshold has been to, set to a very, very hard angle uh, or, or, or a lower uh, threshold. So that way it breaks more faces apart because it's, it's already right that. So if I... Uh, oh, I left it on that other one, so it just generated another UV <laughs> channel. But what you'll see is you start to get these these other ones that are just kind of overlapping still because, yeah. it's, again, it's just like a texture UV. This isn't for like a light map where we have to have these things spaced out. Um, but you start to get more faces that are broken apart. So, um, But if I increase it, and then I'm going to actually specify a channel and... And then when I do it, what we start is we start getting that angle threshold that's been uh, so these ones that are a little bit more than ninety degrees, mm -hmm. um, it breaks them off into their own um, UV charts and UV islands, rather than uh, keeping them all connected. Yeah, they're mentioning that being able to use this for quick iteration as yeah. well as like at game jams when you just oh this one didn't have UVs, you know? Right. Yeah. So. Uh, there's there's a lot of programs that we support, you know, importing data with, especially mm -hmm. with DataSmith that that may not generate UVs, um, and this gives us a quick option to be able to to have something and get it back within that zero to one space too. So, so you can actually use the in editor tools and see see what we have here. Yeah. Um, and then um, if we come to generate UVs, this is the one that I really find super useful. So. What we now have, um, and especially for like some of these simpler objects like this right here, where it, where it has more of a defined shape, it's not too crazy. Mm -hmm. um, we can do a projection type, uh, so we can do box, cylindrical, or planar. Um, for this object, it's you know it's very much a cylinder. Let me. Where my camera speed go? Oh well. What I can do is target whatever the, let's target three since that's what we've been editing. Maybe. Oh yeah, that'll be, okay. And then when we do the show gizmo, you can actually see what this is as well and how it's aligned. Um, and just like collision boxes or any other kind of, you know, volumes in, in these, I can actually grab it and move it around. So that makes it really useful. Um, if I get it too far off base, I can just go right back to fit. Um, and then when I apply, it's already got one for that space. So we can see with this cylinder option, it's actually kind of laid everything out in a way that's uh, more useful for getting. Uh, I'll tell you what, let me do it on UV channel one so we can actually see the texture change. You should use it where it's actually useful. So with this, we can see that the texture has now changed. It's not just that uh, uh, way it was, um, where it was just straight down all the way across the cylinder. Mm -hmm. um, but for instance, if I did like the box mode here, we start to go back to that. My sides are actually getting the that box projection as well. Um, same for all the front faces and side faces from whatever that, that side of the box it is. Um, and then the plane is very much uh, a similar thing, I can choose how I want to say if I wanted to do it some crazy angle. I can change the angle at which that, that texture uh -huh. and, and that UV is being projected so that way it, it generates that UV map. So it's like you, you have many more options than we used to have yeah. um, in generating this. Um, you still do have uh, a lot of your, um, for the light map generation, we still do have our build settings here which is really good for packing and choosing the minimum light map resolution. And you can still go through generation that way. Um, it's still very useful. And for the unwrap, like if I were to go and do the light map automatic uh, one, let's see here. Just about 80. Did I do it? 
do the one I want to edit. See, no, no questions relating to this. It's pretty straightforward. Yeah, yeah, this one's pretty straightforward. Just kind of play around with it and you kind of get some ideas. Um, yeah, I'll just kind of leave it at that. Um, and then let's jump into the next one. So, it's pretty cool. Um, some other questions, uh, not really related to what we're talking about today. Um, can a variant be stored in structs or variables? I'm not sure. Okay. So, um, the asset type, possibly. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I can open it up and see. Uh, actually, I don't have any in this level. We can get back to yeah, the here as well. Yeah, we can I'll, I'll leave the question. Um, I, I'm, I'm just going to say I'm not a I'm not a guru on the variant oh. manager. Like, <laughs> I, I found my use for it and, and for the quick demonstration, so um, I would say definitely reference the, the documentation. I know, yeah. I know it can be used in Blueprint uh, quite a bit, so um, there may be some stuff there um, for, for getting setting. I know we can do a lot of that stuff, uh, so um, totally still not a Blueprint wizard, so. <laughs> We're all Blueprint wizards. Blueprint makes you a wizard, I'd say. <laughs> uh, you know, I, I get a simple thing running in Blueprint, and I'm just like, yes, <laughs> this is amazing. I need to find more time to do this more. <laughs> um, most, most rendering things kind of keep me uh, swamped these days with more of our our, our awesome features, um, and a lot of them don't tend to be very blueprint heavy. So right. So uh, I, I get to become expert in in all these other areas, and then get to ask really informed questions to to other people that know all the the blueprint wizardry. Right. That, that's the one thing I do love about Unreal. It's like you you can you're never really a master of it all. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, to anyone who is, man, like some of our tech artists, like I, I would say they probably are. It's like, oh man, hats off to them. But um, okay, so let me jump into this one, and I just uh, let's see here. So this is um, this is an example template that we provide. So uh, we had our new workflow that went out in this release with creating projects. So. When I create a new project, um, and this one's located under the ArcViz in, uh, Architecture, Engineering, and Construction, um, and we have the ArcViz uh, template here, and this has a scene set up, and it's using uh, ray tracing, and has a sequencer set up so it can show you some time of day transitions, um, and we have uh, it's using the new Sun and Sky actor that we have, along with um, the new Sky Atmosphere. Um, component that we have, so yeah, we showed uh, um, Ryan Brooks is on the stream. Yeah, you're we doing the the landmass stuff four right? weeks ago. Yeah, yeah, yeah so uh, yeah, uh, the the sky atmosphere. I was like, every time I look at it, I'm still blown away with like like the beauty of it. I just kind of get lost. And it's like, oh, that's a nice sunset, and that's I didn't gorgeous. really have to. I didn't have to like you know tweak a million different settings, uh -huh. and you get something just like almost like right out the bat. So. Um, we have this template to kind of help people out as well, and it's using um, using that, but it's also using the, the Sun and Sky Actor, uh, which we do have documentation for, some, some really uh, uh, good stuff to kind of give you an overview. So the Sun and Sky Actor, um, what we can do is go to Plugins again, and then if you just type in uh, Sun, you get this uh, sun position calculator. So if you remember, this is, this is a, a very accurate uh, um, geographical uh, sun positioner uh, asset that we developed uh, quite a while ago. Um, it's been in a number of releases, and it was, it was very accurate to the sense like you could actually uh, plug in all these different values and get very accurate time of day simulations, um, which is very important for some industries. So we needed uh, a way to also have a very simplified one that just gives you like the bare minimum of things, and you can still use sequencer to adjust some of these um, properties. So um, with this, like whenever you hit play, the sequence starts up and you'll get some of these uh, time of day transitions that are happening. So we have several different time of day transitions that are happening in the sequence and it's going through and it's just adjusting uh, uh, all these properties for the, the it's, um, for the sun position, the sky atmosphere, and it's got some some uh, math and everything that it's all doing in its assets. So if we come to the world outliner here, you'll find the sun sky. And 
And then what you'll find in this asset, and again, uh, when you enable the plugin, you can you can find this asset right over here in your modes panel and drag it in. You don't have to use this particular example level, um, but it's just a blueprint, and it's got uh, it's got a bunch of wizardry going on, and it's uh -huh. doing a bunch of math and calculations, and uh, it's using a dynamic skylight, directional light, and our sky atmosphere. So that way, when everything is uh, used in sequencer, it's actually positioning based on information that we plug into the details panel here. So if I select my base uh, sun sky asset here, what you'll see is we have the location so we can actually use uh, the latitude, longitude, time zone. Um, you can set the, the offset for the, the north. Um, you can set the, the month day. Um, and even like daylight savings time and all this. So, so for industries that, that need something you know that's a little bit more simplified and a little bit more specific as well, you can you can use this asset to get get that starting point, um, and to have these accurate day and night simulations. So, for instance, like if you're in um, manufacturing ArcViz and and you're doing a render of a scene, you want to actually have that accurate sun rotation happening. Um, so, you know, based on the, the location you are in the world, so that way right. you can actually see how the sun is affecting. You know, what it, like I've been in buildings before, like in my, my previous careers, like, you know, it's like where I sit, it's like sun is coming directly in that front window yeah. and it's just blinding all day long, you know. So, you know, having this type of visualization where we can do it in real time, it just, you know, right. gives you that, that little extra edge without having to. And when you, you want know. to visualize your mansion, you know, before yeah. you build it, yeah. Oh, I don't know. <laughs> that I, sun I, is hitting I, the. If, the I, could, if right. I could shift my house like 15 degrries, I can tell you I would. <laughs> like, yeah, at some, some points during the day, man. It was like the way the sun comes in. You need just blackout curtains, but, um, but yeah, it's uh, it, it's got a lot of uh, options here for you to play around with. Um, a lot of simple options. Um, and let's look at the the sequence real quick. Um, since I did call that out, so if I open up the uh, sun sky, we've got those three ones that are set up. And then when I open up each one of those, uh, you know, we're just taking the solar the the time of day that we're starting at, um, and then the the month and day. So you can get a you can get a quick little um, idea of, of how to set up a simple scene using sequencer and 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 how we did it for this option. So, um, but yeah, it's a it's a nice little addition. I think we added a bunch of new little templates uh, this past release. So yeah, do you want to show again how you can add them to the project while it's already open? Oh, yeah, yeah. So let's just do this. Um, let's go to create a new level and create a blank one. Um, and just drag in our uh, sun and sky. And again, everything is dynamic here. So um, dynamic skylight, dynamic uh, directional light, and then the, the, the sky atmosphere um, component. So we have everything. Um, yeah, there's not even a skybox in there, right? Yeah, yeah, no skybox. This is just a new atmosphere. That's what I was telling you. I, mean, I, mm -hmm. I get lost in it. <laughs> I'm like, man. That's that's a beautiful world, right? Yeah. There. But uh, um, yeah, and if I just uh, I'll just quickly just toss in a landscape, um, so that way we can fill the black void down here. And I think later this year, I saw, saw some questions on the forums regarding like how you can combine the sky box mm -hmm. and the sky um, sky, sky atmosphere component. Mm -hmm. um, and I believe most of that work is coming uh, later in 425 uh, this year. Uh, Ryan Brooks was talking about it on oh, the yeah, street. Yeah. He was showing up some um, of his. Uh, oh yeah, stuff. yeah, 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 yeah. His the uh, volumetric or, yeah, his, or fake volumetric. Uh, yeah, clouds. his because uh, I remember he started years ago, like on some of his volumetric stuff with uh, the clouds and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. um, and he showed some of the stuff on the stream with yep. VR and painting clouds. Um, and I remember seeing an email. It, it had you know his little volumetric thing. I was like, wow, that's 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 really cool. Yeah, <laughs> it's like, um, how did I just uh, man I le leave it to me to. <laughs> Do this every time. Add a large landscape. Um, oh, there we go. But yeah, so you know, with our just our landscape, you know, just covered or whatever. Um, now, one thing I will say is like I think I've seen people try and report this one as a bug. I think I even tried to report it as a bug myself, but it's it's not, and I'll tell you why. Um, and I call it out in the docs too, because just if there's any confusion. So I'm holding Control and L right now, and I'm able to just kind of move the light. Uh, move my sun directional light around, and you know, and again the sky atmosphere component. Man, this is just get these nice little sunsets and and everything. Um, so I may have moved it out of position of where 
the the Sun Sky uh, actor expects it to be with the rotation. So. Um, So if I go to change, yeah, you see it just popped right back up into uh, a higher in the atmosphere um, time of day. It, uh, that, that pop is actually intentional because there's some, uh, the sun sky component or, or the, uh, that, the actor here, the blueprint, expects the sun to be in a certain position so that way it knows where the rotation is. So that way when you're creating the simulation or you're adjusting some of the properties to get the actual you know, geographic location and the time of day, it knows its starting point. So it's going to pop back to wherever it was. So okay. if you start just using the controls um, that we have to just position it over here, and you, if you see it pop back to somewhere else, um, that's the reason why. It's, uh, it's an expected thing um, because it needs to know a location. Did I click on something? That's the oh, uh, that's sculpt. the paint. That's yeah. the paint. Okay, that's I was nervous. Like, <laughs> you can tell I don't use uh, uh, land landscapes all that much. Yeah. So if I just touch my actor and I start to rotate it or whatever, it pop right back up to that bright high noon kind of thing. So um, looks really nice, though. But yeah, the uh, the documentation we have kind of goes over the 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 sky atmosphere. So if you're really intrigued by you know that and some of the properties and changing you know. Um, the look of your sky atmosphere, uh, I do have full documentation on that. Um, and then the, the, this asset as well does have documentation breaking down what it is, uh, you know, how we use it in the scene and how you can use some of the, the different things to, to achieve, you know, these kind of looks that you want. They are wondering if the, uh, the new sun sky includes a uh, night with full moon and stars option. Not with stars, uh, we leave that up to the user to create with their skybox. Um, there's some material stuff. I actually want to do a how-to at some point on, on how to set up that material. We have a template level um, that has uh, some material um, clouds and stuff like that. So create a new level. You'll see this new time of day one. Um, save that. So, sorry for a second. So, um, one of the things I think you'll notice too is like uh, the intensity on that one was. So I'm using. You see this a little bit of a faded because I enabled the. You know what? I am terrible today because I completely forgot one other thing to show. We got time. So I know, I know. Um, but it makes more sense if I show it while I'm in the middle of stuff. But, anyways, uh, there's a with the Sun Sky actor and. Um, let me drag one in real quick. So one particular thing about the Sun Sky Actor is that it uses an extended luminance range for auto exposure. This means that um, our directional light is using physical values. So one of the things you'll notice is the intensity here is set to 75,000 lux versus the one in this scene um, doesn't have that enabled for the project by default. Um, so it was using like one lux for the directional light um, with some auto exposure values to get the, the desired look. Um, so under the project settings, if we just come and we type in extended or extend, um, you'll get this option here for ex extend the uh, luminance range for auto exposure setting. And when this is enabled and you restart the project, um, this means that I can now have the 75,000 lux and my auto exposure is going to adjust and look more correct. I, I can use correct um, exposure values and a luminance uh, range here for the intensity. Um, that is more phys physically accurate uh, than, than what we were previously using and the auto exposure will adjust. Um, the difference being that if I didn't have that enabled with the Sun Sky Actor when I drag it into the scene, it's going to blow out the scene and, and appear bright white because that light is so bright. So. That's uh, something to keep in mind. I actually do mention that in the docs as a, as a gotcha in case anyone runs into it. But with this scene, um, so coming back to it, uh, this is one where we're using the Sun Sky and we actually have a material in the Skybox here. And we have some, some uh, ray marched uh, volumetric looking clouds or whatever um, that are used and then 
don't know why that's appearing just black. But oh, I know why it's appearing black because of the reason I just said. The the sun was so low that I've got to wait for the time of day. I've, I've got to wait for the. So let me actually put this on a correct physical value, and then what I get is the actual because it was it was set to one lux and okay. I had extended the luminance range. So auto exposure has to take a second and and go okay. <laughs> let me let me brighten it up here. Um, but so one of the things that we can do is with this you can actually get the uh, we have this material that's 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 uh, taking in some of the uh, sky atmosphere nodes that we have in the material mm -hmm. and reading back from those so it's actually um, adjusting properly um, but someone asked about a moon right yes so one thing you can do on this and I didn't want this to really turn into a sky atmosphere stream but we can do a little bit so if we add a second directional light and we'll leave that at 10 lux, it's fine, whatever. And then let's look for, um, uh, need to do this, go to sky, no, not that. Uh, atmosphere uh, sunlight index, and I'm gonna change that to one. So what I'm doing is I'm telling the sky atmosphere that there are two lights. Okay. One is the directional light, which is automatically at zero. The second one's gonna be our secondary light. So that'll be our moon, right? So, um, and then also, could just type atmosphere to begin with. Um, you also need to enable this atmosphere fog sunlight. So when I enable that, all right, you see yep. this little dot up here appeared. So if I do Control Shift L, this gives me my moon, or what I want to represent, whatever my secondary light is. Mm -hmm. um, and this could be used for a second sun. As it well, can be, right? yeah, 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 second sun, definitely. Um, yeah, because you you have all your controls here. So the source angle is controlling my size of that light. Um, I can control the brightness of that light, and since I just want it to be, you know, a moon object or whatever, and to make it a little bit more moon-like, I'll give it a nighttime kind of color. And then my directional light. So if I do Control L, I can do my sunset and get rid of that light. It's gone below the horizon and Control Shift L. And I now have my other moon light. Look at that. that. Is Don't know where, well, which it's, part of the universe we are yeah, in. Yeah. So it's not interacting correctly with the material because we're only referencing the one directional light. Okay. So that's the craziness you're seeing there. But it gives you this trippy kind of yeah. you know, otherworldly sky, right? Mm -hmm. um, so that's an option too. But uh, yeah, I'm not sure on the, the, the stars and celestial, uh, you know, because like if I want to create like a celestial representation of whatever, like if I want to have another planet or let's just say that be a moon, mm -hmm. um, that's stuff that I need to figure out and I want to do for docs because this is stuff that I discovered while I was working with it and I was like, man, that's that's pretty cool stuff. Yeah. And it's so, easy and how it's, you can use the you know the, the default uh, BP sky, yeah. sky sphere and just go like daytime, nighttime. Right. Yeah, daytime. yeah, exactly. So um, yeah, I think that's that's all very valuable stuff that I would love to see get added to this at some point or either be, you know, in documentation and we mm -hmm. should help people how to do it. Um, so it's definitely on my radar. <laughs> Do you remember, they were asking, I know there's a way to do this, I just can't remember the console command, uh, but they were asking if there's a way to disable the little tutorial ping. Uh, yeah, in your project settings. Um, or editor preferences, maybe? Um, it's from the other. I also think there's a, uh, a CVAR. There is a way to permanently disable it. Yeah. Um, nah. I will follow up on that, because I yeah, remember yeah. I took notes on it's, that, so I can you know, remember it. <laughs> It's, it's, probably gonna be, it's, it's probably going to be like yesterday where I, I was searching for that one thing and I found it on Answer Hub and it's something I answered from like five years yeah. ago. <laughs> it's probably going to be something I can go back to my desk and search real quick and it's like, yeah, yeah. someone someone on our, our support team answered it at some point. It's been in there for a while and it is possible. Um, but yeah, I don't know it offhand. There's a lot of things that I you know, forget while I learn other new things. <laughs> um, yeah, is there any questions before we move on? And then I, um, I think... They, they're that, talking so. a little bit about performance 
um, when you're using the SunSky mm -hmm. uh, component. Um, and I, I think sort of how like they've added it to their projects and they're mm -hmm. taking a performance hit. Um, and I guess you know there's so many different considerations when it right. comes to dynamic lighting and mainly I would say dynamic shadows. Yes. And which ones of your meshes are actually drawing them and which ones aren't? You know, using cascaded shadow maps, right? Yes. If you have your entire everything in your landscape drawing a shadow, that's not yeah. how the you know how it, the it, open world games work. It, it could be hard to kind of you know troubleshoot that kind of thing for the for the reason you said. It's like you know there's there's so many different variables. Um, I'd see more of a concern if I put it into a basic scene and then it's just like a, right. a significant performance and it's like okay. Is this expected or is this not? Mm -hmm. um, because then we can start to make justifications of, you know, it's like, okay, you know, what is actually where we can improve or, you know, is this something I have to live with? Yeah. Um, and the best way there is always you know, just to run. Um, and, you know, it's like, I think the, the, the Sun Sky 2, um, or the Sun Sky actor, it, it works really well for visualization because it's, uh, it's a combination like where you're doing these time of day things. I would say if you want like a time of day, you know, set up um, on your own, uh, I'd either create it myself or use the sun positioner because that's a standalone object as well. I think okay. I, I don't remember if that one actually had the skylight and the that one actually might have the skylight and the the time of day stuff. But I I don't know the difference between the two if um, because I've not done any performance differences mm -hmm. actually. So got to run some logs to figure it out. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, it's a very very context driven question <laughs> just depending on your project too. So. They were curious about the planetary view. All you got to do there is literally just fly out. Oh yeah, so um, I won't do. It. Let me do this because you can't with this one with the material and the way we've got everything set up. And this one, if I did the if I did the planetary view, I just kind of pop over the sky and then I don't see things after a minute. Um, it doesn't give me the planetary view, but the the other one. Let's just go here real quick and then. Directional light, sky atmosphere. Come back to my directional light, and then I'll type in Atmos. Enable that, and then I come back to my scene. I don't know, maybe fly up. Yeah, as I start to fly up, um, and all I'm doing is just holding E on the controller with my right mouse uh, button clicked. Um, I start to quickly move up and into the the higher atmosphere. Mm -hmm. So you start to see that that uh, that planetary you know um, curvature. So for the horizon. So yeah, and I think if you go even farther, it actually looks like yeah. So um, let me just increase my yeah. You have to go pretty yeah. far. Yeah. <laughs> Ryan Brooks is doing this as well. You know, th the first time I was messing with uh, with the sky atmosphere when I was starting to document it, I was just kind of like, I was like. Oh, okay. Let me just start playing around with this. Like, how did they get the world? Because I, I was given some images that had like the world view, um, and this kind of curvature. And I was like, man, that looks awesome. Yeah. Like, how do I get that? And then it's like I just started just climbing higher, and I started seeing the curvature. I was like, oh, let me just keep going. And it's just like I was just. I think I posted on Twitter because I was just like, this is awesome. Yeah. And it's like I didn't have to do any real setup. I was just kind of add these things and enable a checkbox, and then just kind of rise up into the sky. So, um, yeah. Let's see. Um, someone was asking us what our uh, favorite feature in 424 is. This one? Yeah, my <laughs> answer is actually the Sun Sky uh, component as well. Uh, but I'm also really excited about OpenXR support and the, oh, new, yeah. uh, the new way we're doing inputs for all. Yeah. I, th I think everyone has like you know their own opinion on you know depending on like what their their specialty is and it's like you know with mine on rendering um, and just a lot of the fun stuff that I see you know this one by far it's like I, I was telling Sebastian I was like man this this one's just like blowing me away yeah I was like I was just constantly just like in awe of like the work that he does and it's still in beta it. right yeah yeah or no no I think this one's uh, this one is is ready production ready okay uh, okay it, it was not beta on this one um, and it's very it's very performant too so Flip around. Let's see. Was there something else that you wanted to cover today? Um, I think the last thing we were going to do is a little tease. Okay. Well, I th let's, let's get into it. Are we good for that one? Yeah, okay. yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. So let me just go ahead and just close this project down. And let me drag this other one over here. So I was able to work on this project uh, with some very talented people for, for quite a while. Um, and Vidra told me that uh, um, there's a stream coming up. With, yep. Yeah. So in... 
not next next week, but yep. the week after, mm -hmm. the lead designer on this project, Pasquale yeah. uh, Cianti, he will actually be on the stream talking about um, how he designed all of this. And he's been doing a lot of amazing ray traced scenes. Yeah, he's he's done a lot of stuff with UE4 Arch for yeah. for a long time, and it's like his work is like I I knew him well before I started working with him on this project. Um, you know, and uh, you know, my main role is just you know it was documenting you know everything that these you know I got to sit in on a bunch of meetings with, with our tech artists and our programmers mm -hmm. and going through the decisions that they were making for the scene and how that actually developed some new features that went into 424. Um, like for instance, with ray trace GI, we now have a new uh, the final gather method, which is more of a uh, um, it's a, a a screen version of, of GI so that way it's actually more performant. You can actually get these, uh, like I was showing Victor earlier and we were getting uh, 50 FPS or more in this scene alone and, and still getting GI and getting some good mm -hmm. quality while working in the editor, um, you know, versus the brute force method which is going to look at a higher quality and it, but it's uh, but it's more performant or, or performance heavy. So yeah, it's um, it, it was a fun project and it's like I'm, I'm really excited to see, you know, Pasquale talk about it over the, you know, the stream that's coming up but this was, uh, actually this is, let's see here, let me turn real time on. I'm getting a lot of aliasing. But yeah, it's, um, it, it was fun to see that, that development of this, this over the, the, the course of a, a little while, so, and yeah. That's exciting. Yeah, and I'm, I'm glad he was able to make some time to uh, come on here. Um, let's see if there were any more questions. Otherwise, I think it's, it's almost time to wrap up here for today. Starting off a little, a little easy, you know, <laughs> new decade <Yeah>. and <laughs> everything that's everything about it. Um, it's a question. I'm not sure I understand this one. Anything about local skylights or imitating IBL with it? Uh, nothing that I'm aware of right now. Okay. Um, I know the local IBL has been a question that's been um, asked for quite a while. But, okay. But I don't know of anything that's that's coming down the pipe on that one. Um, is the performance better than with the base dynamic lighting? Better than what? Uh, the Sun Sky. Oh, on the Sun Sky. Um, okay, so with the Sun Sky, um, well, hold on, the, the base light. Uh, I are, guess are we talking, just, are we just talking about uh, ray tracing or movable? Or are we talking no. about stationary or what? Um, so I'm assuming a I'm assuming mm -hmm. a dynamic directional light, mm -hmm. having done the scene and then comparing the performance with that versus the Sun Sky um, atmosphere component. Well, it depends if you have those exact same components in your right. So your scene, because so. of the fact that it comes with a skylight, it comes as with well. a sky, it comes with a movable skylight mm -hmm. and it comes with uh, it is in a blueprint and it's doing some math. You know, there depending on what settings if you're using a sequencer mm -hmm. and so, um, I don't I, I can't really speak to the performance but um, I don't imagine there being a significant difference no, you know while working so with it it's like I never noticed because like, while working with the sky atmosphere documentation and while working with the sun sky you know I was doing the same thing I was creating these assets um, and these scenes uh, to toy around with and to document uh, using those same kind of actors and setup, I just wasn't using the blueprint logic and all that stuff that was going on in the sun sky. Um, but it's like, you know, I never had any issue in the scene, but it's like, again, these scenes that I'm, I'm using in it are a different context than what you're developing for a game, so you have to take that into account and see yeah. where things are, are getting hit. The, the biggest thing you have to worry about with a time of day transition and simulation is when you're at a lower horizon, especially if you're using shadow mapping, you have longer shadows that are cast, so you're shadows are going to be more costly during that time of day than if they are at a high noon or a midday. Because they're covering of, uh, less areas. Right. So That's interesting, yeah. Yeah. Because like, like I, I used to see like performance, like it, it get just a little bit right before it goes below uh -huh. the horizon and it's like, okay, it's like, what's going on there? You know, it's, it's because those shadows are longer um, casting, so you're hitting more geometry and they're, they're affecting more things. Something yeah. to take into consideration. As things go, there's a lot of things you have to take into consideration when you yes. when you make games. <laughs> <laughs> um, sometimes it's not always what you expect it to be. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> well, um, thanks Tim for coming. Yeah. Here again, showing off some of the uh, some of the new content in 424. Uh, we'll make sure to drop links in. Um, I'm actually going to try to start uh, putting them on the Twitch page for mm -hmm. the, the latest stream, um, in case you don't want to dig through chat to find them. Uh, we also usually put resource links inside the forum announcement post, so you can go 
go and find them there. Um, if this is the first time watching the stream, we do this every week or almost every week. I shouldn't say every week and <laughs> put me uh, put me in that nope. scenario. You, we we you, also get vacation occasionally. You've committed um, to it for the year. I guess so. It's another <laughs> fifty one to go. Um, but uh, we appreciate you joining us. Um, every week we have a survey. If you like the stream uh, or if you want to let us know what you'd like to see in the future, please go ahead and fill that out. Everyone who enters their email gets to be part of a t-shirt raffle, um, which I'm about to send a bunch of them out nice. uh, this week, actually. Hopefully. Yeah, tomorrow is the plan. A lot of shipping tomorrow. <laughs> um, we uh, A few days after the stream goes live up on YouTube, um, uh, one of our copy editors uh, who actually is, is she's trans uh, transcribing the entire stream and so you can turn on captions um, and watch them but there's also a nice link there in case you'd like to go ahead and maybe you were just you know watching the stream and maybe not paying 100% attention maybe you're doing some work but you remember something that you heard um, and then like oh do you, was it at 30 minutes was it at 50 was it at yeah. you know an hour or something it's two hours when we're sitting here <laughs> uh, it can be difficult to find it and you can actually open up that text file search for your key terms and then find the timestamp we, we were where we were discussing that during the stream it's That's a nice awesome. way yeah it's a nice way to find it and we do that for all the streams it's between um, two to five days depending on um, how long and how much we were talking <laughs> uh, and how much of an accent um, was present in the stream. Um, but they go up there and you can find them in the YouTube description. That's nice. I, I just need more ways to have like control F in my life. Just and control Z. Yes. I, I wonder oh man, yes. That would be lovely. I would like <laughs> that. <laughs> um, remember to go check out our online communities, our forums, Discord, uh, our unofficial community uh, server, um, Unreal Slackers, Facebook, Reddit. Um, we're also on Twitter and LinkedIn and all of the other. So everywhere, practically. Technically not. Okay. But but close. I don't know what you consider if you can consider that everywhere because the mm -hmm. internet is fairly. One day. No. Okay. In one day, it's all just one big. Metaverse, <laughs> maybe. Um, if you noticed, uh, we actually just, was it today? I think it was today or yesterday. We received a new countdown video from the developers of Castle Day. Uh, if you would like us to uh, showcase your development process uh, as part of our countdown, go ahead and take 30 minutes of development, speed that up to five minutes, and send it to us with a uh, your logo separately so that we can composite nice. it uh, with the countdown. Uh, we'd love to see more of those. Um, if you're streaming on Twitch, make sure you use the Unreal Engine category. And uh, as always, make sure you follow us on social media for all the news, which streams are coming up. Uh, and as of now, you can actually see the, uh, the entire schedule for January. Uh, it is on the Twitch page. Um, and I've got links there to all the form announcements. And go check it out because so next week, we have uh, Aaron Langmead coming from the UK. He's going to walk us through how to set up a local uh, version control mm -hmm. server and how you can build that with um, S, uh, Subversion and Tortoise. And then we're also going to show you how you can set it up on a cloud server using Perforce and then do the editor integration and talk a little bit about um, some good things to think about when you're working collaboratively mm -hmm. uh, using version, version control. A uh, week after that, I already mentioned, we have the uh, Archvis demo from uh, Pasquale Cianti. Yes. And then for the last week of January, uh, developers from Gearbox Software will be here to showcase how they built uh, parts of the world of Borderlands what? 3. That's awesome. What? Hype. That's, I'm that's really excited awesome. about that. Yes. It's going to be cool. They'll be here in the studio. It's going to be a good time. Um, special thanks to everyone and all of you who's always watching uh, and all of our partners and everyone who's using Unreal Engine to make amazing things. Um, with that said, as always, hit us up on forums or Discord or, uh, or Twitter yeah. if you have any questions. Um, fill out that survey. They're really useful for us <laughs> so that we know uh, what we're doing well, what we're not doing well, and also knowing like what do you actually want to see here on the stream. And then we try to do our best to make sure that uh, we get that content on the stream. So yeah. with that said, uh, until next week, we hope you all have a great, great rest of the week, including the weekend. Weekend's a good time. Uh, and we'll see you all next week. Bye, everyone. Right. Bye. Thank you.